Sheikh Rahman, welcome to Real Vision. Thank you, pleasure. We've known each other a long time, and you're my sort of go-to guy when I'm thinking about emerging markets, and right. so I'm really happy to have you on Real Vision here. And in fact, actually, because you're at a transition, you're not, uh, you, you've had m much time on the buy side and the sell side, but now you're going right. independent. So this exactly. is a perfect time to get sort of an unvarnished view of what's happening in emerging markets. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like to think of myself as someone who calls it like it. I see it. <laughs> I think that's been my reputation over the years, uh, but it's it's a great time to to be uh, transitioning uh, more independent, uh, setting up my own fund uh, in the coming months, and I'd love to share my thoughts with you on how I'm seeing markets and EM in, in particular. Great. You know, I want to get a uh, sort of a 30,000 foot view, but then maybe also get some mm. positioning, asset allocation uh, from you in terms of what you're thinking about uh, right now in 2020. Yeah, that sounds great. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. A big part of uh, the setup for the fund strategy will be uh, an overlay of investment themes coupled with a more systematic approach. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll certainly relay my my overall thematics for, for the markets and what that means for investment opportunities in the space as well. When you talk about that overall thematic, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the conversation that we just had in terms of how you break down uh, different parts of EM. Because basically yeah. you told me that it, when people t think about emerging markets, a lot of people think in a global term, emerging markets. But yeah. within emerging markets, actually, there's a lot of differentiation and people should be thinking in those terms. Yeah, I, I think that's a great place to start. And let me step back a little bit, take, take us back to the late 90s and get us to where we are now and think prospectively as well. Um, you know, EM used to be a beta to global growth trade in a sense, right? If you thought that global conditions were very supportive, growth was robust, then EM was a great investment opportunity. It was kind of boom and bust in that sense, right? And that type of strategy worked really well. And if we think about uh, the genesis of, of EM as an asset class over the last, say, 20, 25 years, the late 90s was really an important time. We were getting out of successive crises, right, in the, in the 90s, tequila crisis uh, amongst them. We saw uh, institutionalization of some financial sector reforms, which included opening up of these economies to the, to the rest of the world. Uh, that was really important. It led to um, uh, a rash of inflows into these, into these economies. Uh, and this was also happening at a time when we saw the um, accession of, of China to the WTO. Um, and as well, um, uh, successive uh, monetary policy easing, uh, particularly by the Fed over the 2000s. So from the late 90s till mid 2000s was a really good time for, for EMs. You saw a rise of commodity prices uh, as a result of China's incessant demand for, for commodities and other imported um, intermediate goods. That was very beneficial for EMs as they opened up. So it was a virtuous cycle that, that was manifesting in the late 90s, early 2000s for, for EM. And that was the, the kind of, you know, golden, right. golden time for, for EMs. And as you say that, I'm, I'm sensing yeah. a button's coming here. Or something. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, a big one, <laughs> a big one. And that, all, that all changed in, in uh, early 2010s. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you saw essentially a slowing down in China, right? It, it shifted more towards a consumption orientation rather than the fixed asset investment orientation. Growth began to slow in China in part as, as a result of that. Uh, but you also saw uh, a, an erosion in competitiveness for, for EMs. And we'll talk about this a lot during our talk. I mean, one, one of the, the main indicators that I look at for, for EMs is uh, the real effective, real trade weighted exchange rate. That's mm -hmm. a really good indication of, of course, it's a measure of relative price. But for me, it's an it's indication of, of underlying competitiveness. And the big problem for EMs is that they lack competitiveness. That's the real issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so going back to the 90s, 2000s, you know, what we, you saw was easy to grow, right? You didn't have to do much. Um, you know, this was a perfect opportunity for, for EMs to institute, you know, deep structural reforms, uh, get, get the, them on a, a much stronger um, growth footing for the future. They didn't really need to do that, right? And so now uh, they're in a position where their com competitiveness is challenged, right? Uh, they, they're struggling for growth now less reliant um, uh, on um, you know, these, these prior sources of, of 
of um, growth like China, China demand and things like that. So they're struggling, right? Uh, EMs in general are struggling for growth. You know, if, if you look at it, the forecast for EM growth this year is around 4%. Uh -huh. so that's, that's deceptive, right? If you take I India, China out, uh, let's say, to, to the bigger EMs, EM in general is growing around 2%. That's, that's not much more than, than developed markets, right? right? Some uh, in the market are calling it the secular stagnation of EMs. And, and that's, I think, appropriate to, to consider that if you look at growth in particular. Um, you know, EMs are, are and have been relatively challenged, and I think that's a, a, an issue that's going to uh, persist in the in the in the coming years. So, when you uh, look at that picture, I know that you are looking at challenges on three different fronts. I mean, you yeah, talked about that's right. you know commodity issues like Russia. You were talking to me about mm -hmm. uh, the people who have the external imbalances that yeah. could come to. Uh, uh, talk talk me through those three groupings that you talked about. First and foremost, yeah. I think with the external imbalance uh, com countries, because yeah. those are the ones where you might see some crises. Yeah, those are the ones that tend to be most in the headlines, I, I guess you could say. Um, you know, if you t think about the challenges that EMs in general face, and I don't want to take that notion too far, because part of um, the thesis that I'm presenting here is that EMs were considered, you know, a, a, a unitary block, you know, in the past, and I don't think that we that we should be thinking about them in that way going forward. There's a lot of differentiation. The dynamics are very different across countries, right? So I, I think it's more important, instructive, and beneficial to think about them on on a standalone basis mm -hmm. rather than as a as a broad grouping, right? right? Yes. So I don't want to take that notion too far, but <clears throat> um, if you think about EMs from the standpoint of the challenges that they face. Yeah, I'd, I'd put them in three broad groupings, right? Those that are suffering from internal, external imbalance, right? Um, Argentina and Turkey are, are prominent in, in that grouping and um, they've seen a, a massive adjustment, you know, in 2019. Um, so they'll still suffer the repercussions of that, I believe, over the next year or two. And then you have um, the, the broadest grouping, which is I, I call countries that are in the middle income trap. This is really a manifestation of what I talked about before, not really taking advantage of the virtuous cycle right. to, to institute structural reform. And, and Chile, would they fall into that grouping? Yes, uh -huh. absolutely. Uh -huh. I think I think the, the the poster childs really for for this group are Mexico and South Africa. We, we, we've seen a real decline in uh, underlying investment activity for various reasons, right? And, and it's going to have repercussions for, for growth uh, going forward. They're, they also tend to be two of the more prominent EMs uh, as well. So I think they're, they're really instructive in terms of this broader grouping. Um, and I think the discussion on EM really centers around this. You know, it's kind of the middle income trap for EMs, right? They're, they're stuck in middle income territory. Income per capita has been stagnating. Um, and it's causing social disruption. Right. We'll get to that in a second. I think that's a really important sub-theme. And that's why I was thinking about Chile in particular. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Obviously, we've seen you know, massive protests, and now they're moving to, to reform the Constitution. That's going to take time. We've seen that spill over into Colombia as well. I think this is a, it's a real product of, of this fraying of social contracts, I like to call it, which we're seeing manifest, particularly in EM. It's not going to go away. In fact, it's likely to intensify. And it's a part of this middle income trap that, that EMs are in. This essential notion is that, look, you, you guys can, uh, for lack of a better phrase, you know, pad your pockets all you want, but give us prosperity, give us growth. You know, that's the sort of underlying right. social contract. And you know, we're seeing a fraying of that, right? You're not providing us with, with the prosperity that you, we, we were promised. And so, you know, you get protests and social tension and those sorts of things, right? You're seeing it in Hong Kong, you're seeing it in terms of the manifestation of, of political changes in the developed world as well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, populism and those Definitely. sorts of things, right? It's, it's pervasive, right? It's not just an EM thing. But the issue for EMs is that you have relatively young populations um, and you need the growth, right? right. It's, so it's, it's much more intensified in, in, in the case of EM and I think we're gonna see a lot more disruption there. So, you know, that's the middle income trap story. Part of it is this fraying of social contracts that we've started to see and we're likely to see manifest in much more intensity going forward. Um, you know, so uh, 
Chile, Colombia we talked about in terms of some of the tension. Um, those certainly flag, um, you know, prominently South Africa as well. The way you can think about it is mapping measures of inequality, um, trajectory in income per capita, um, you know, government effectiveness or sense of corruption. Those are good metrics to look at to see how countries rank on a relative basis. And countries in Latin America, unfortunately, favor quite, you know, poorly in, in, that, in that regard. South Africa, Turkey as well. Countries in Central Europe, not as much, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, you're going to see this dislocation, I think, across. Um, and I think countries like not really Chile or Colombia is prominent, but Mexico, South Africa going forward are going to be much more in the spotlight as far as how countries are dealing with that middle income uh, challenge, let's say. Uh, and, and, and what's the third group that uh, you were talking about? Yeah, it's the it's the ones that are that are, have been much more reliant on commodities, right? Uh -huh. and it's a it's a relatively large group, but it's it's you know I, I I'd like to think that it's it's you know narrowing. Um, you know, a country like Russia is is you know kind of the poster child for for that the heavy reliance on on um, you know hydrocarbons, right? Particularly, and I think it's really interesting that. Uh, the, the reshuffling recently of, of the government the cabinet uh, by Putin and the focus on investment spending, you, you know, to, to bolster growth going forward. I think that's a positive, positive step ultimately. I mean, Russia has been known for, for being really fiscally prudent, but you know, uh, at the at the um, uh, sacrifice of, of growth, you know, they've been, been making promises for years about. You know, um, investment. You know, um, structural reform and those sorts of things. And I think now they seem to be redoubling their their commitment to that. So I think that's a good sign. It's a good step. Um, they made other strides to decouple, delink um, the economy from from oil. You know, as relates to the budget. So those are all positive moves, actually, and and should should benefit Russia if they follow through in in not only. Um, Delinking Russia from from oil, hydrocarbons in general, this commodity linkage, but also fostering much more favorable growth growth conditions. So Russia could be a very positive story in that in that respect. Yeah. It, and you know what's interesting about what you just said is is that you're talking about this cabinet reshuffle from a real perspective. As yeah. in it's not just so that Putin can remain in power. That actually behind it is some thinking about. Uh, a Russian growth and actual real Absol e economic. Absolutely, absolutely. From, a, from an investor perspective, you know, you think about it from a real, from the real, you know, aspects, impacts. And from that standpoint, what, what we're seeing is, is a move towards, you know, bolstering growth, you know, reducing the, the ties to commodities. And that's, that's a, a positive thing, absolutely. Now, uh, just to uh, complicate things a little bit, I wanted to make an overlay because I was just thinking about something that you talked about, like the three Ds in terms of thinking about uh, emerging markets. Yeah, absolutely. It's to me the the broader thematic for EM, and this hopefully resonates with listeners, viewers. Is is dollar dollars debt and demographics? To mm -hmm. me, that that's an enduring thematic for for EMs. And if you're thinking about EM at all. These three aspects figure in prominently, not just now, but but in the future. So we, we should talk about each of those aspects. I think they're very important. And, and and to be honest, they're they're not very well understood even by EM investors right, and, right. and experts. Yeah. Right? Uh, they they don't understand these dynamics that well. Because this is where the rubber hits the road. Let me let's let's take uh, an example. Since you uh, highlighted Mexico and South Africa, yeah. Let's look at Mexico in particular yeah. in terms of. Uh, this middle income trap, mm -hmm. but also in terms of the three Ds that you were talking about and how that manifests itself in terms of investment opportunities yeah. for, for people. So how do, talk me through uh, an investment in Mexico yeah. and, uh, given those preconditions. Well, let, let's step back first. Let me, okay. let, me, let me predicate the discussion on individual countries on, on, on the broader dynamics that are at play here. I think this is super important mm -hmm. for people to understand. And appreciate, no pun intended, uh, as far as currencies are concerned. But the dollar is is a is a prominent uh, aspect of investing in in EM, and I think we should dive into this a little bit because it's Definitely. so important. And it's not very well understood. Um, it, I think people are coming to understand it a little bit better. But you know, hopefully, I can shed some light on on the importance of the dollar for for EMs. 
So when we think about the dollars, we think about first and foremost dollar-denominated debt, right? That's right. what people think about yes. for EMs. And yes, that's been um, something uh, of a concern uh, on the face of it, right? So if you look at it, the Institute of International Finance, they, they measure uh, global debt, and um, EMs have seen um, a significant rise in, in overall indebtedness, right? Something like $70, billion, $70 trillion in, in, in debt, 200% of, of GDP. Um, that's near double what it was uh, ten plus years ago. So it's been a significant rise in, in indebtedness. And is you know, in terms of overall global indebtedness, is that uh, what's driving uh, mm. indebtedness increases? It's a good question. Uh, um, to a large extent, yes. It's been China. China's uh, accounted for something like forty percent of that rise. Mm -hmm. You know, other EMs not so much because they're relatively small. You know, from an economic standpoint, right? But what we're seeing, we've seen, is a significant rise in dollar-denominated debt from from non-financial um, corporates in EM. So from three trillion. 10 years ago to 6 trillion now, right? So that, that's a massive increase, right? And, and you know, on the face of it, it seems right, quite concerning. Mm -hmm. But, uh -huh. you know, to me, it's, it's not a concern, right? That's the stock of, of dollar-denominated debt. EMs have um, something on the order of uh, $8 trillion in, in uh, hard currency assets, right? More than offsetting the, the rise in, in external uh, debt that we've seen. So the rise in external debt was three trillion to six trillion, and most of that was due to the rise in corporate dollar-denominated debt. About eighty percent of that was in dollars, right? So the point is that you can't just look at one side of the balance sheet, right? Six trillion dollar-denominated debt. You've got something like eight trillion in dollar assets, right? Right. That offset that. So you know, there's plenty of of dollars there to to pay down the debt if, if, if it's needed, right? But the question becomes about liquidity provision, right? Having the dollars when the, the, the dollar payment is due. Yes. That's the real issue. So it's a liquidity concern, consideration, not yeah. a solvency consideration as far as EM is concerned. And we were talking about this uh, before the broadcast, and I was telling you that I had seen a, a podcast, I'd listened to a podcast where Perry Marilyn was talking about the money view, about settlement risk being uh, the biggest risk in liquidity mm -hmm. crises. Uh, you know, like he thinks repo in particular is a nexus of, of a liquidity crisis because that is uh, because the Federal Reserve and other regulators have pushed people into secured credit as the place in order to get liquidity, repo in particular. And as a result, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this euro dollar offshore funding is happening there. So right. to the degree that you have a risk to these corporates, it's going to show up. Uh, in terms of their liquidity provisions in markets like the repo market, uh, absolutely. So you know the way I like to think about it, there's 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 three kind of legs to this stool in a sense, right? There's the stock of of debt, right? I don't think that's a major issue. I mean, it varies by jurisdiction, right? Some countries have enough dollars to to pay down the debt. Some ha have less, right? Those sorts of things, right? So that's one one leg of the stool, right? Um, you do have a, a high redemption um, level this year, something like six trillion uh, of that dollar debt is due this, this year. So it's a high rollover risk this year, right? So, uh, you, you know, that gets to the second point, which is liquidity provision, right? It's not just the cost of the dollars, you know, which is relatively low now, and that's why you're seeing uh, this amount of issuance um, in, in the dollar market for, for EMs um, over the last couple of years. Uh, this year is no exception so far. Um, so the cost of dollars is one thing, but the access to the dollars is another one, which right. you, you rightly point to, right? There are some offsets to that, though, okay. right? Which is that central banks, you know, have, have dollar uh, FX reserves that they can use, they can provide swap you know, lines and those sorts of things, which many countries have done of late, you know, to provide some needed liquidity to, say, corporates or their entities, domestic entities that need the dollars, right? They can't do that without limit, but it, it does provide an out for uh, times of, of uh, dollar stress, you know, when dollars are, are less available, right? Um, a good way to look at this is to look at um, the, the um, uh, cross-currency basis, you know, mm -hmm. if you see a tightening in cross-currency basis 
in dollars, that, t that tends to be a sign of, of scarcity of dollars, right? And we're not really seeing that right now. We haven't seen it for many, many years, since 2011, 2012. So it seems to be okay uh, on that side, but that's something to, to monitor, right, for sure. And I think that that's likely to be a source of, of significant strain for, for not just EMs, but global markets, you know, when the plumbing really starts going, going haywire. I want to talk about the third mm, leg, and mm -hmm. that's that's also one that's very much misunderstood, and that's just the dynamics in the dollar, right? So we keep talking about dollars as it relates to EM, but it's so important, right? So EM fortunes are, are largely tied to the dollar, right? Believe it or not, and, and that's not just in terms of the stock of debt or the availability of dollars, but the direction of the dollar, believe right, it or yes. not. So the dollar strengthens or weakens that has a pervasive impact on, on EM um, growth conditions, let's say. And the reason why is because the dollar will tend to um, tighten or loosen domestic financial conditions for EM. And that's through the exchange rate, right? The exchange rate for EMs is an important nominal anchor. Why? Because institutions are relatively weak, you know, even s central banks, you know, don't have the uh, the level of confidence you know that you have in developed markets. So the the currency is an important nominal anchor for for EMs, and it affects balance sheets as well. The, the exchange rate, right? So if you have a period of dollar strength, you, you'll tend to get a weakening in domestic balance sheets. You'll you'll tend to have an erosion in confidence because the domestic currency is weaker. So you'll have a tightening in domestic financial conditions. Credit and that's conditions not tighten. what you see in developed markets. Correct. It's the opposite of what you see in developed markets. Typically, when the, the domestic currency weakens, say, versus the dollar, that's a loosening in financial conditions, right? That's a good thing, right? It's the opposite for EM. So when the dollar strengthens, the domestic currency weakens, you have a tightening in domestic financial conditions. So the fact that the dollar, the real effective dollars uh, is strengthened by something like 20% in the last uh, five plus years has led to a tightening in domestic financial conditions for EM. And that, that's a big part of why EM has slowed, right? Why growth has been so, um, so anemic, right? Is because of the, the tightening in domestic financial conditions as a result of the strengthening dollar, right? So there, there are a lot of the, the dollar is very prominent. It's a very important aspect of, of how you think about EMs in general. Definitely. So if, if you're of the view that dollar is going to remain steady to stronger, you can't be optimistic on on EM growth conditions, right? And and then as we talked about before, the fact is that social strains are increasing. That's going to lead to potential political disruption as well. So you have to bear those those aspects in mind. So it's not just that you know, dollar funding rates are low. There, there's a bigger part of the story to it. And, and so wh where are you on that, that score in terms of where the dollar is headed or where it's going to remain relative to uh, other currencies and why? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. My, my own personal view is the dollar is likely broadly fairly valued in a sense, right? To me, the real exchange rate is an indicator of, of relative competitiveness. It's a, it's a measure of relative price, not necessarily a measure of valuation per mm -hmm. se, because that, that you have to bring in you know, flows, you know, dynamics in terms of flows, and you have to think about the current, the equilibrium current account and these sorts of things, right? So in that sense, the dollar is more fairly valued than overvalued, right? I, I know there are people that disagree with that notion, oh. um, but but I think the dollar is broadly fairly valued. Uh, think of this too, it's kind of a, 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 a crazy thing, but the fact is that there's a lot of demand for dollars. That's partly why it's been strong, right? So a lot of this issuance in dollars leads to demand for dollars for repayment, right? So it keeps the dollar relatively strong. So I think that's likely to be the case going forward, right? I and mean, let's remember the dollar is remains the safe haven, right? right? Even in spite of you know twin deficits and those sorts of things. So I think the dollar is going to remain relatively uh, robust uh, over the coming months and, and years, actually. And so. Broadly speaking, that is slightly negative then for emerging markets. Absolutely, it is. I mean, uh, you know, that's why I like to think uh, again, EM is a relative uh, value opportunity rather than a directional mm -hmm. uh, opportunity, and and that's going to be my focus is looking at EM from a relative valuation standpoint as opposed to directional. Yeah, you'll get periods of risk on, risk off, as you have have in, in broader markets, and the beta of EM is. Is higher, you know, so you'll tend to get better performance and risk on, and worse performance and risk off. That dynamic's going to remain unchanged, right? But I think we're we're in a in a an environment where um, 
investing in EM is really going to be about picking your spots, the winners and the losers, rather than taking more of a directional bent right. uh, on the asset class per se. Well, let me uh, ask you in terms of the dollar about this whole concept of the dollar smile. That is, mm -hmm. is, is that when the U.S. on a relative basis is doing well economically, the dollar is strong because obviously the yeah. uh, financial conditions are going to be tighter. But then, uh, you know, the dollar is weak when on a relative basis, the dollar, you know, like the U.S. conditions are the same or, or, or slightly worse than everyone yeah. else. But then suddenly when there's a crisis situation, everyone wants uh, U.S. dollars. Uh, w is that an interesting framework? And to the degree that it is, where are we within that, uh, that curve? Yeah, I, 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 I'm a proponent of that, that view generally. I think the, the dynamics have changed a bit, though, where, where the, the strength of, of the dollar in, in prior cycles was you know, the strong capex and, and the growth momentum that, that was generated as a, as a result of that. We haven't seen that, right, mm -hmm. of, of late, right? The investment has been relatively low, and there's hope that we, we see a massive pickup in the capex cycle. And if that's true, then certainly we'll, we'll see that, that side of the dollar you know, uh, being quite prominent, right? Inflows to, to, the, to the US, right, strengthening the dollar. The dynamics are different though now, right? Because it's all about dollar funding, right? To me, it's changed, right? The, so the demand for dollars isn't so much about, um, you know, growth prospects for the U.S. Right. You know, there's some of that because uh -huh. of the relative yield advantage of dollars, you know, depending on currency swap rates and things like that. There's some aspect of that, right? But to me, it's more about the demand for dollars that we've seen as a result of the uh, tremendous issuance of, of dollar denominated debt out there. So that's the, that part of the equation, right? And so I think that's going to become and remain relatively prominent. So I agree with that, but the, the dynamics have changed. And, and yes, it's still the case that, you know, when, when um, things go awry, you know, the, this one of the safest havens is, is, is the U.S. Is, dollar. The US dollar yeah. and, and that sort of, uh, there's a reflexivity there in terms of heightening the crisis because therefore exactly. you have the risk. And one yeah, of the right. risks, you know, just to go back to your whole thing about EMs, uh, one of the risks that I would imagine is in terms of the balance sheet. That is, mm -hmm. uh, we, when we spoke before, you were telling me these corporates are not necessarily hedged. Yeah. So to the degree that they're unhedged, that means that their liabilities in a crisis situation would be increasing because the dollar uh, value would be increasing, and their That's assets right. are stagnant or potentially decreasing. So the you know the positives that you were talking about from the asset liability perspective become skewed in a negative direction. That's a great point, and, and it's the, the interplay of two of those legs, in a sense, right? The balance sheet with the dollar dynamics, right? And and you can get an adverse outcome. It could go either way, depending on right. the direction of the dollar. But if the dollar strengthens, right, you, see you have this adverse balance sheet outcome. And what you've seen in EMs over the last five, seven years is this um, yeah, advent of the of the currency trade, so to speak. So they'd borrow in dollars and and um, and denominate in, in local currency, right? You you can't carry it hedge. It's too costly, right? right. It's just too costly in, in domestic terms. So you, you saw a lot of that, uh, you know, five years ago, and you, you there were a couple of disruptions, you know, in, in the corporate space as a result of that. I think EMs have learned. You know the lesson, and so you've seen policymakers, particularly clamping down on net open dollar positions and, and things like that. But you still see, from my work, you still see you know significant open dollar positions, right? Meaning, if the dollar strengthens, you're going to get an adverse balance sheet impact, right? right? Um, from from that from that movement. So that's still prominent in 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 EM, and that's part of the the dollar dynamic equation, right? That's going to lead to a tightening in financial conditions and and have adverse impacts on aggregate demand and, and growth conditions yes. for EM. So yes. that's a big big issue for for EM still. I mean, it's it's decreased, I'd say, uh, over the last ten years. But it's still it's still an issue. It varies by jurisdiction, by sector, and things like that. But in, in aggregate, it's still a problem for for EMs. So now. Obviously, when we're talking about the whole dollar dynamic, the Fed is the lender of last resort in U.S. dollars. Yeah. Uh, so they're on the hook to a certain degree. They're on the hook. If there's a liquidity crisis. They're on the hook, yeah. Uh, my question is, Is are there other central banks, let's say the Bank of China, uh, People's uh, uh, Bank of China, yeah. that could potentially... Uh, through swap lines with the U.S. central bank, provide liquidity, and therefore 
bail out, if you will, uh, corporates out of a liquidity crisis without the Fed specifically uh, provisioning liquidity to those central banks. Yeah, it could be. We've seen that on a limited basis, right, where there had been liquidity constraints or, or concerns in some countries. China would, would negotiate with other countries to provide some liquidity provision, not without conditions, of course. Right. right. Um, we could see more of that, right? Um, you know, China could tap their three trillion of dollar reserves, for example. You know, I, I could see that as a possibility. Uh, yeah, we got to think about the cascading impact of all this dollar issuance, right? So EM corporates, right, have issued a lot in the last 10 years, right? You think they're on the hook for that? No, absolutely not. Their governments are ultimately on the hook. It's a contingent liability for the governments, right? Right. If corporates in their jurisdiction get into trouble, right? They're on the hook, right, by pro providing dollar liquidity through their, you know, central bank FX reserves, for example, or, or other means, right, macroprudential provisions through the banking system, other mechanisms like that. It's the governments that are on the hook for that, right? And, and who's on the hook, you know, for, for the governments? It's, it's the Fed, ultimately, that's on the hook for <laughs> that, right? It's the Fed that's going to have to provide that liquidity if and when we get into a situation where there are their dollar uh, access constraints, right? And that will happen. It's just a question of when and how that, that happens, right? right? I, it's hard to, hard to time that and foresee that exactly happening, but it, it will happen. And the Fed's going to be on the hook for that, ultimately. The preconditions for it's happening right now, in your view, are not present. When you were talking about the balance sheets earlier, yeah. you were largely positive. Yeah, uh, uh -huh. yeah I, don't, I don't see that as an imminent risk. Right, uh -huh. famous last words, but you know, <laughs> look, I, I've been, you know, I, I, like I said, call it like I see it, and I, I've been, you know, very prescient in, in a lot of these, you know, disruptive outcomes that we've seen in markets, um, and, and I don't see it as as an imminent threat or concern. Partly because central banks, policymakers have kind of learned their lessons, so to speak, from from the past in a way, and I think. They're very much attuned to these, you know, disruptions in, in you know, money markets and, and in the funding markets, let's say. And, and I don't see any signs of, of, of stress there. I mean, of course, what happened in the repo, repo markets is, is, you know, an example of it. But in a broad sense, I haven't, I haven't seen signs of it. So I don't, I don't necessarily see that as an imminent uh, risk, but it's out there. Right. It's certainly yes. out there. So let's dive down into specific countries, and then we can also, uh, at the end, talk a little bit about relative value, what mm. that means in terms of investing. You know, I'm yeah. very interested, as you could tell, about Mexico, South Africa, things like that. Yeah. Uh, talk me through, now that we have sort of the macro picture for yeah. the, the dollar side of things, uh, a Mexican uh, investment or the preconditions within Mexico for that. Yeah, so looking at Mexico, um, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, you, you have um, uh, Lopez Obrador, who's who's more populist and, and pushing for um, you know social reform and things of that nature. He's less focused on growth, um, you know, which which isn't necessarily a good thing for for Mexico in terms of you know forward looking trajectory. You know, like I mentioned, Mexico, South Africa, poster childs in a sense for for lack of investment. You know, which will have adverse impacts on. On growth going forward, so Mexico is a, a, a real, you know, um, example of that, unfortunately. So, and the focus on social reform and things of that nature is taking the eye off, um, you know, I'd say deeper structural reform that will will benefit the the economy. So that's a real issue for for Mexico. The the, the positive side of it, though, is that uh, the country remains fiscally prudent. You know, the initial conditions are. are relatively favorable for, for Mexico. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a slower burn, I'd say, to, to, that, to that end. Um, you know, you can't countenance that with, say, in Brazil, where, um, you know, there's more of a focus on, on moving towards structural reform efforts that benefit the economy. Uh, it's, it's going to be a challenge politically, but I think that's, that's you know, uh, you can look at Brazil a little bit more favorably from, from that standpoint. Um, South Africa concerns me deeply, right? Because mm -hmm. they're in a, in a vicious uh, trap, you know, a fiscal um, growth trap um, that's going to be very hard for them to, to get out of. Um, I, I think 2020 could be uh, seminal for, for South Africa in that respect, right? Um, what, what's really going to be important is that they get their fiscal house in order to avert a, a credit uh, rating. Uh, downgrade by Moody's, which could right. trigger forced selling 
of their local debt because it's in the in one of the um, most representative global indices um, and could tr drop out on a, on a downgrade. Um, I think that's more than likely to happen. It's only a matter of time. I think it happens this year at some point, the downgrade, and, and that will lead to forced selling. So I'm, I'm quite um, concerned about uh, market dynamics for, for South Africa. Um, it's similar to what happened in Brazil in 2013, the sort of dislocation we saw there as a result of fiscal slippage and growth, and it's the same dynamics we're seeing in South Africa playing out. So that, that's a market that I would be quite cautious on for oh, yeah, yeah. In, in 2020. I think we're gonna see a, a potential disruption there, absent you know, very, very you know, concerted efforts by the, the government to address you know, the fiscal slippage that we're seeing there. So you know, when you look at relative value plays, uh, it sounds to me like uh, South Africa is for sure one of the countries that's on the negative side of that. Yeah. Or, or has the, the market cottoned on to this and therefore uh, the price is No, not that? yeah, not at all. I mean, in fact, the, the market's taken a more benign view generally of, of the, the scope for this, uh, this occurring. So I think the market's not priced for, um, you know, I'd say potential fiscal uh, deterioration and, and the market disruption that could result from that. So, you know, South Africa is certainly on the on the, the sell list. Right. Uh, the currency in particular, um, you know, and, and local rates will we'll see the, the biggest adjustment in, in that, I would say. So uh, I have heard about South Africa being a country potentially in 2020 to get downgraded and therefore there's a vent risk there. Yeah. Are there any other countries in particular that you'd put in the same bucket for 2020? Um, you know, we talked about this earlier. Colombia is one that's kind of in, in, in scope as well. Why? Because you've seen some, some political tension. Um, and that may limit the scope for the government to institute, you know, a reform agenda, and, and that, that could lead to, you know, disruptive market outcomes potentially. So that's not as acute, I'd say, as, as in, in the case of, of South Africa, right? But mm -hmm. if you look at it from a valuation standpoint, the currency in South Africa, to me, is overvalued. In Colombia, it's also overvalued. So that, that puts it in that category, you know, of, of um, markets where you could see underperformance. Right. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, countries where you're likely to see outperformance or where there's poten potential for gains is Chile. I think mm. the market mm -hmm. there is overshot considerably, right? And I think hopefully you'll, you'll get some you know, noise here and there, but the move towards you know, reform of the Constitution should hopefully um, ease some of the tensions there, and the market's more than adjusted. Um, so I, I like Chile from that, from that standpoint. Russia, too, is potentially interesting, right? The valuations are, are compelling. Um, this move towards you know, fostering growth with the cabinet reshuffle is, is I think, an, a positive one. So I, I like Russia um, you know, on that side as well. So from a local currency standpoint, Chile or Russia I favor, don't favor Colombia and, and South Africa. Those are the, the, the pairs that really, really stand out to me. Now, when when we hear uh, you know macro tourists talk about EM, they're mm -hmm. thinking about you know Argentina and Turkey, and actually, obviously, China, yeah. uh, which we haven't talked about at all. Right. So, first of all, talk to me about Argentina and Turkey. Why we're not talking about them, and then secondly, why we're not talking about uh, China. Yeah, great question. Uh, so Argentina and Turkey have gone through uh, Argentina, in particular, significant. Uh, currency adjustment to address their imbalances, right? And that's going to help, right? It's going to help uh, ad address some of those imbalances, right? Um, you're going to see uh, a moderation in the external uh, accounts, which will be beneficial for their funding and, and so forth. Argentina is on the path to restructuring their external debt. That's, that's one, one thing to, to be mindful of. But that's a potential opportunity, right, mm, um, mm -hmm. to, depending on the conditions of, of that restructuring, right? The, the perverse thing is the more they haircut, the more upside there is, right? Because the exit yield, the exit... Um, um, uh, level of, of, of the debt is going to be lower the more they haircut, right? Because they'll have less debt to repay, right? So perversely, the more they haircut, the more upside there's likely to be for, for, for the debt. So that's something to monitor, right? But in general, um, the policy orientation is still a, a major concern. And the currency, as much as it's adjusted, doesn't seem overtly 
uh, cheap. So from a competitiveness standpoint, Argentina and Turkey are still relatively challenged. Uh, and Turkey itself it still needs to undergo more of an adjustment, um, I would say. Um, and the path uh, of policy is not conducive, um, not reassuring. So we're still going to see some disruption in, in those markets over, over 2020, um, I, I believe. Um, and it's not quite time to be thinking about you okay. know, investing, maybe opportunistically, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Central Bank of Turkey is likely to, to go on a relatively aggressive easing campaign, you know, so there could be some opportunities, short-term opportunities there. The restructuring Argentina uh, could be very interesting. We'll have to monitor that very closely. But in general, there's, there's not, you know, it's not like, oh, wow, these guys have adjusted significantly. It's time to buy. We're right. not in that mode. Uh, just yet for, for either of those countries, yeah. And and then China. Yeah, this is a big, big topic, right? I mean, the the I, I like to call it the Sino uh, schism in a sense, right? Um, uh, which is which is this divergence between the West, U.S. prominently, and China in a sense. They're going on diverging paths. It's not just re related to trade, but it's what's happening with you know the the advent of emerging tech. Um, Huawei, absolutely. Five right. G, you know, and and you know, uh, who's going to take the ascendancy in the East South China Seas? Those sorts of things are going to lead to this divisiveness between China and and the West, U.S. most prominently, right? And who, where are other countries going to follow? Are they going to follow the U.S. and going to follow China? Um, this is a big theme, right? It's going to be an enduring theme. It goes beyond you know short term trade spats, right? Um, it, it's, it's a much more enduring um, rivalry, so to speak, between the, the U.S., West, and China. Um, you know, part of that manifestation is, <clears throat> is going to be how China manages its own, own economy, right? And, of course, we know that it's shifting towards more domestic consumption as opposed to fixed asset investment. It's really hard to get off of that. You know, we've seen actually China relevering, not delevering, right, over the last few years. So it's going to be hard, a hard shift for them, for them to make. Um, you know, the growth is going to slow there. It's going to you know, increase social tensions, I believe. You know, that's the most important aspect for um, the leadership in China to be to be mindful of is you know moderating any social tension rather than the economy itself. So I think China has the levers to to manage through that. Right, it's a relatively closed economy, and I, I think China will will do well to to manage that. Um, I also think that China is going to be much more um, uh, assertive in, in managing its, its debt, the, the buildup of debt, you know, and there, there are ways to, to get around that. They've done, done that in the past, and I think they'll do that in the future. So I'm not as concerned about this buildup of debt in, in China as, as other people are. They'll, they'll address it in, in, I think, relatively unique ways, right? So it's not as much of a problem. So, so it sounds kind of like uh, because you don't think that there is a crisis, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, coming to China, mm -hmm. the, and and because it's been picked over by so many people, because you know it's the elephant in the room in emerging markets, yeah. it's not really a sexy place to make a relative value call. No, it's not. It's not. It's not really. I mean, it's kind of a muddle through. Think about it as a muddle through. You know, growth in China is probably going to be below 6% now. whoop de doo I mean, so what? You know, people were saying, oh, the hard landing in China is going to be going from 12% growth to 6% growth. No, they're, they're managing it reasonably well. I mean, yeah, it's a little bumpy, right? But in general, they're, they're going to manage it relatively well. I think the coronavirus. Yeah, I think that's obviously that's an, that's an issue, right? For not just for China, but for the rest of the world. We're seeing you know markets responding to that. We'll see how that plays out. Hopefully, you know, like the SARS scare, you know, um, it 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 you know becomes contained, right? Uh, we'll have to see. But I, I think the issue for China is more about social, you know, maintaining social um, cohesion mm, and stability. Mm -hmm. That that's really the issue for China. Right. It's not about the economy, right? For the for the global markets, it's about social social um, uh, stability. It's not about the economy, right? I know that sounds strange, but to me, a hard landing in China isn't about the economy. It's about, you know, the social stability, right? right. And that's, I think, in the minds of the leadership as well. So I, I don't necessarily see a, an imminent economic crisis in, in China at all. Uh, they have the tools, the wherewithal to address that. So the issue is more about the, the repercussions of, of the slowing in China growth, right? 
which is, of course, affecting EMs, which were heavily reliant on, right. on China. Yes. Uh, Europe, to some extent, right, as well, which is suffering from that slowdown. So the, the world economy in general is taking a notch down in terms of uh, growth conditions and needs to find ways to offset that. You know, um, let um, me ask you then, so just to sum up, uh, I feel like uh, what I got, is certainly from a relative value perspective, is Russia and Chile, certainly on the one side, yeah. and uh, South Africa, uh, for sure, mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on, on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any specific issues or issuers, from a corporate perspective especially, yeah. that we should be thinking about? Well, you know, the one that's that's very prominent right now, and it gets back to Mexico, is, is Pemex, right? Mm. It's it's a big contingent liability for the government, and, you know, its its balance sheet is, is under strain. It has a lot of, you know, funding to do for investment, and where's that funding going to come from? Is it going to come from the, the government, or, or are they going to get the wherewithal to, to do the funding themselves? Um, so I, I'm, you know, quite concerned about the, the fate of Pemex. I think ultimately this, the government the sovereign is going to have to provide more of a backstop to, to Pemex. So I think that's going to be a big story for, for 2020 is, is, is Pemex, you know, the state-owned oil company in, in Mexico. And that's going to have adverse impacts for the sovereign as well in terms of, you know, the contingent liability for it vis-a-vis -vis Pemex. So that's, that's a big story that will play out this year. Good. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We'll have to have you on investment ideas at some point in the future to, uh, to you know, go through some of these investment theses later on in the year. I look forward to it. Thanks so much, Ed. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.